Yep, just uh, an update on the Big Data Meets HPC market here. I'll go through it pretty quickly. You've seen some of these before, but this is just our kind of attempt to show the historical progression from HPC uh, originally out of government and academia. And then toward the right here, you start seeing commercial companies um, using HPC for analytics who really didn't use HPC for anything before. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, this one, it, this is still how we see the market dynamics here. Um, what you've got is um, modeling and simulation, sort of the original HPC market and still the main HPC market, um, organically growing the big data portion. Um, and then advanced analytics, kind of two thrusts there. One, uh, the historical HPC market doing more with analytics and then bottom right, uh, that's relatively new, which are commercial companies that have never done HPC before, uh, being pushed up into the HPC competency space by their problems, uh, by competitive forces that are uh, requiring them, them to deal with problems that are a lot more complex and also time critical. Uh, one thing that sometimes gets lost in the mix, um, iterative methods used to not qualify for leadership computing or as leadership computing. Um, you know, maybe they'd use only 100 cores, but if you have to, if you're a commercial company and you have to run the problem 100,000 times, you really can't afford in time or anything else to do that sequentially. So this kind of problem has also moved up into the definition of leadership computing and is being hosted increasingly at leadership sites. Um, I kind of talked about this a little bit. This is what's kind of driving it. And by the way, these slides are available, the slide set to anyone uh, who's here, just let us know or give you your business card or email, we'll, we'll send them. Uh, these are the four market segments um, that we see in uh, that new segment of commercial analytics. There will be more, but these are the first four that really are repetitive use cases that, that constitute, you know, pursuable market segments. Of these, business intelligence is, well, fraud and anomaly is the largest one today. Uh, business intelligence is the one that's growing very, very quickly, and kind of the, the, the tortoise in the race that will probably win the race in the end is precision medicine. Uh, because of the, the size of that, the healthcare market that is, over time, has a good uh, a chance of being the very biggest market for uh, analytics, HPC. This is what it looks like in a forecast sense, going out about three and a half billion dollars uh, in the out year there for um, the server side of it, add another billion and a half for the storage side, and so it's just a shade over, in 2020, just a shade over five billion Altogether, the traditional the established HPC market uh, for big data growing at, you know, between two and three times the rate of the overall HPC market, and the new commercial segment piece growing even faster than that. Uh, this is from our 2015 uh, worldwide study of HPC end user sites couple of slides here. We are just about to release the 2017 version of this. Uh, but what we looked at here is we, we just asked them, what percentage of all of your HPC cycles are devoted to big data analytics? Not just big data, but the analytics piece. And you see here that it's getting to be serious in government, less so in academia yet, and really is about a third of all the cycles already uh, in, the, in, the, in the industrial commercial realm. Um, one of the other things we wanted to know are, is, is this one, are, are you running the big data problems, the analytics problems, and the simulation problems on the same uh, system or on separate systems? And this is how it kind of played out. Um, and we also want to know what's going to happen in the next six, 18, six to 18 months. About half of them are running on the same system today and have no plans for changing that over this time period. 
Uh, it's not easy to get budget always for an extra HPC system. About a quarter of them say, yeah, we're running them on the same system today, but over this time period, we're gonna separate that out. Um, another quarter said, we've already separated it out, and we're gonna continue keeping them separate. And very few said, uh, we separate them and we're gonna go back to one happy family running everything on one system. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this, I think this the postal service, which is on its either fourth or fifth generation uh, of HPC. They're one of the places that's kind of commercial looking and um, moved up to HPC maybe six, seven years ago. But the interesting thing was the test that they proved to justify buying a system with a very, very strong uh, memory architecture. Uh, you can see the numbers here, I won't go through them, but you can see they just saw their performance falling off the cliff if that processor couldn't be run um, in memory. And uh, they, uh, they ran a pretty serious benchmark test at that. The only one that to have passed that test of everything they've tried has been SGIUB, and that's what they've been using. Um, future application, one big area is smart cities. The circled things, transport and energy are things where HPC has been involved for some time. HPC um, for some time has been used to manage power grids. Um, and also in transport, as we know, we heard yesterday again, to, for upstream design of vehicles and also for urban traffic management. And so it's not hard to see how this is gonna to come together with HPC playing a pretty big role in smart cities. Internet of Things is another one. There are some roles for HPC that we see there um, in talking with governments about their plans. One is network wellness management and security. China's HPC uh, IoT plan going out to the year 2030 is already based on HPC. Um, I mentioned before dense local nodes for traffic and power management, uh, but also there's, there's a use in edge computing. Most edge computing is not gonna need HPC, but when you've got all those sensors out there, there are some applications out there where you're going to want to process that locally and not move it. So an update on what we're seeing uh, from research we've been doing in deep learning. I think we've been doing a pretty serious study at least once a quarter. Um, I'm not gonna go through these, but <laughs> The point here is, this, these are uh, what some people talked about yesterday, this is all use of HPC for expert systems, um, for medical, for healthcare providers. And you can see that these use cases are popping up all over the place. Um, IBM Watson is uh, kind of the name that's best known here, but I promise you x86 clusters are doing the same thing already, except for the natural language ability right now. Um, so here's kind of a summary of the, the findings of deep learning. One is it's not easy to move from um, machine learning to deep learning. That's a, a difficult journey. Um, what we see happening is a ton of activity uh, in deep learning and expectations that it's going to become mainstream within two years. Um, one of the other things we see is that if you're in the realm of Google or Baidu or, um, or Facebook, you have plenty of data to drive deep learning. If you are outside of that realm, you are in trouble. You do not have enough, in most of these realms, you do not have enough data today to do deep learning. Case in point, and we have many of them we talk to, um, is um, United Health Group. They have about 100 million people that they cover, not nearly enough to do deep learning. And they have built a facility in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Optum, their Op Optum Lab subsidiary, where they've invited all of their main competitors to come in and to kind of pool anonymized data to get, so they can get to the point where they can actually start playing with deep learning, but that, that is a big uh, issue there. Uh, so well, a lot of the stuff that's happening today outside of the 
kind of the internet realm and the web services realm in deep learning is uh, people uh, prototyping stuff on workstations uh, for use within, they say, two years or so uh, to move to the data center onto servers. That's, that's kind of the scene. Uh, NVIDIA GPUs kind of rule the roost today in that ecosystem. The software is built around them. Um, but we expect that to see other things, Intel Phi and sort of the remarkable resurgence of FPGAs that we're seeing all together uh, kind of coming into there too. One of the big uh, issues that vendors are having here is there really aren't good benchmarks. Um, and so they're having to spend two, three weeks per client just discussing what would be satisfactory results. Now will you buy what we're selling? That kind of a thing. Um, and also there's a big language problem. There always has been an HPC, but this is kind of the CP Snow two cultures problem where um, the HPC vendors are going in saying, talking about floating point operations and integer operations and the buyers are saying, <sighs> We don't really care about that. Tell us how many, um, how many potential cancer agents we can eliminate quickly, um, or tell us how many cancers you're gonna be able to detect per second. You know, talk our language. Don't talk about this machine stuff. So that's gotta be an issue, but one thing is for, for sure is that the forefront of research in AI, in machine learning and deep learning has moved to HPC. So we're, we're right in the crosshairs of all this. Just quick cloud summary, what we're seeing is that the number of sites, the percentage of HPC sites that are doing something in public clouds has moved way up, but it's still much wider than it is deep. Less, fewer than 10% of all the jobs on average are, are uh, being sent to public clouds. And, um, <laughs> Despite all the progress, security and data loss are still very, very big concerns for people. Um, the private cloud use is growing the fastest, hybrid, kind of public-private, second fastest, public, least fast. One of, the reason, oh, one of the questions that we asked people in a survey that really told us a lot was we asked data center managers, how easy is it for you to decide what to send to a public cloud, what to send to a private cloud, what to keep on premise. And the answer overwhelmingly was real easy. We do not need to be educated. We know how that works. Um, so the real barrier here, as I think we've said for a number of years, is that um, public, more work will go to public clouds when public clouds become capable of doing more types of of jobs efficiently and, and economically. And you start seeing some of that happening here with um, more capabilities moving into public clouds.